Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Jeffrey Beck. Uh, Jeff is an associate professor of wildlife habitat restoration ecology in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management at the University of Wyoming in the Agri uh, College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. He received his bachelor's and master's degree in wildlife and range uh, resources from Brigham Young University and his PhD in forestry, wildlife and range services. He joined the University of Wyoming, which we're really glad that he did. He joined us in 2007 and he had already been a postdoctoral uh, student at the University of Wyoming as well as the University of Idaho. And he's worked with the Colorado Division of Wildlife and the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. So you can see somebody really knowledgeable and experienced. Dr. Beck's research interests lie in wildlife habitat ecology and restoration ecology with a focus on restoring the functionality and structure of wildlife habitats in disturbed rangeland systems, particularly sagebrush habitats, and that's what he will be talking about tonight. The types of research questions that Dr. Beck's lab addresses typically are guided by uh, ecological com concepts that are used as a framework to evaluate conservation questions. Tonight, Dr. Beck will share his expertise and his experience with all of us in a presentation that focuses on indirect responses to energy development of sagebrush-dependent wildlife in Wyoming. So let's welcome Dr. Jeffrey Beck. Thanks a lot. So as I start, I, I uh, wanted to mention a few more things. I really appreciate the introduction that Maggie provided tonight about the kind of work I do. And I am a, a professor with a three-way split. I, I teach undergraduates and graduate students. I conduct research as you'll hear about tonight, and also I'm quite involved with service, and part of that service is outreach, and I would consider our engagement tonight kind of a part of that outreach. Um, the, the kind of work I do, well, I'm, I'm applied. I, I try to do research that solves problems, you know, research that we can apply to real, real world situations, and you can see a list of kinds of areas of expertise that I, that I use in my research, and the thing I will focus on tonight is talking about this kind of set of of uh, impacts that energy development can have on wildlife species and and I've got a whole bunch of examples to show uh, where there's impacts and where they're not impacts and so uh, when you see I'll kind of conclude with uh, some interesting conclusions I, I want to acknowledge my students these are students here that have worked in, in kind of this energy development area either as master students PhDs and one postdoc I've advised and then I, I also really want to make a special acknowledgement to the funders of the work we've done, uh, including a number of energy companies that are prominent in this area of Wyoming, uh, the BLM, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and other federal uh, and university partners as well. And they're all really, you know, without their support, not without their interest and their collaboration, we won't be able to do the work that we've been involved with here in the state. So, well, where, where have we been doing work? I have this map put together to just kind of display the area that we've been in. The green dots are sage grouse studies. The yellow dots are, or I shouldn't say dots, stars. The green stars are sage grouse studies. The yellow stars are studies where we've been working with ungulates. And if there's a red title, that's an energy development study. If it's black, it's more of a habitat type study. And you can see the different places we've been and some of the species we worked with. So I'm going to kind of circle back to some of these studies as I proceed in the presentation. So I'm talking about a, a system that is displayed in this map, and that's the, the sagebrush biome. I'm not sure if anyone in the room knows how large it is. I'm just going to tell you it's really large. It's 153 million acres of land. It occurs across, a, across 11 states where sage grouse occur. There's a few other states that have sagebrush as well. But this map shows those 11 states and the current distribution of sage grouse within those states. When you go in this area, you will find some really unique wildlife species. Um, I think most of us are, are very familiar with the greater sage grouse. Uh, here in, in uh, Campbell County, there's greater sage grouse populations. I think most of us are familiar with mule deer and pronghorn. And the species I'm showing here are about eight eight or nine species out of almost 400 species that use sagebrush, but these ones are called sagebrush obligates because they have to have sagebrush for at least a certain part of their life 
history throughout the year. Some of them eat sagebrush, like sage grouse and mule deer and pronghorn, but there's others that do as well, sorry, like the pygmy rabbit, the sagebrush vole. They also consume sagebrush as well. And we have a, a suite of songbirds that are of real interest as well in conservation, the sagebrush sparrow, the sage thrasher, and then the brewer sparrow. They're also found in this system, and they're very unique in, in their adaptations to obtaining resources and thriving populations in these, in these areas. So one thing that has been discussed a lot and more research is being done on that is the, is the aspect of whether sage grouse themselves serve as an umbrella species for all these other species in the sagebrush steppe. And I'm not here to talk about that aspect tonight, but it's certainly um, brought up and talked about a lot in our state. We have the, the Wyoming Governor's Sage Grouse Executive Order, which set aside about a quarter of the state for protection of greater sage grouse. And one of the ideas is, is that those areas of protection where there's limited development will be able to provide for all these other species that, that use a sagebrush step. And, and something that we're really well aware of is that, that animals that occur in the sagebrush step do oftentimes move long distances. And it's surprising when we think about even sage grouse doing the same kind of thing we normally think of ungulates doing. This is a, a, a model called a Brownian bridge movement model for one female sage grouse from the Bighorn Basin that traveled about 37 miles in three weeks to go from her summer range on the west flank of the, of the uh, Bighorn Range to where she wintered west of Tensleep out more in the desert. And that's where she spent her, her winter and then would return back up the hill and hopefully take a brood with her to, to do her summer activity. So really interesting to think about the movements of these animals. So we're talking about energy development, and I wanted to spend a few minutes just describing kind of the scale, where it occurs, what it, what it means to wildlife. And there was a recent paper that came out in Science, a colleague of mine named Brady Allred published this, and he's just cumulatively showed kind of the distribution of, of all of the um, wells that have been drilled in central Canada and the U.S., and this includes not just sagebrush step, but other states as well. And he mentioned in his paper that between 2000 and 2012, there were 50,000 new wells per year. And the area that was disturbed was about the size of, in that 12-year period of time, was about the size of three Yellowstone National Parks. If that kind of puts that in, into perspective about kind of the scale of development. Um, also, we have wind energy. In our state, the most recent data I had, it indicated there were 14 wind energy facilities with about not quite a thousand wind turbines. And the area in, this, in our country with the highest wind potential is kind of the central plains area from Texas all the way to the Canadian border. And the area with the highest wind potential is right here in southeastern Wyoming where I live and where I work at the University of Wyoming. The wind potential there, and many of you have been there and know the, that area real well, um, it can exceed 10, 10 meters per second at 80 meters above the ground, which is kind of how wind potential is measured. So there's a lot of interest, of course, to develop those resources also. So that's a little picture about energy development, but what does it mean to our state? Um, it's very important here. Without energy development, I doubt this library facility would be here. I doubt I would be here too. I think it's really important that we recognize the economic importance of energy development and production in our state. And, and we're a, you know, one of the highest ranking states, number one in coal, you can see the list here, number three in natural gas, eight in U.S. oil production, and also gaining in wind energy capacity. Um, there's, there's lots of uh, studies that have looked at kind of what the future may be for landscapes and how they may be impacted, and it's pot potentially 21% um, of five major ecosystems in the West eventually may be developed for different forms of energy development. Um, where are the sage grouse? So our state is situated right in the middle of the heart of sage grouse. This map doesn't show this, but I'll just tell you that 37% um, of all the male sage grouse counted on the Lex recently occur in Wyoming. Wyoming also has 25% of all the habitat across all these 11 western states. So it's really important here. This map right here shows where those leks are located within management zones 
that have been designated by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And the reddest, the redder colors you can see there indicate the leks with the highest numbers of males. And most of those, or a good proportion of those do occur within Wyoming, especially kind of the southwest part of the state around, around Pinedale. And then this is a, just another depiction that shows where, where the oil and gas well densities are in those colors. The, the darker blue color is where the highest densities are. And then on top of that, this is a depiction of where all of our leks are. And management zone two, which is mostly in Wyoming, uh, you can see there's over 1,200 leks right there. And then management zone one, which is northeast Wyoming, where we're at here and into Montana, about 1,100 leks. The lek is, our, is the display area where males congregate in the spring to attract females and mate with them. So one last look at energy development. I just wanted to show this to you in a paper that I published with a colleague recently. Um, is just where that energy development is occurring in the state. And you can follow this from 1991 in this panel. Areas that are, that are wider, as they start becoming wider and whiter and whiter, that's where the higher density of oil and gas well pads are. So by 2011, there was almost 40,000 of these in the state and the Powder River Basin has really the highest densities of those, but also in southwest Wyoming and even central Wyoming there are locations of gas fields as well where we've seen more and more uh, development. So that's just the picture, right? So I've kind of explained, you know, what, what's going on, the importance to the state, and now I want to talk right about wildlife and jump into this. So what do we know about impacts? There are two forms of impacts. One form of impact is direct impact. Direct impact are impacts that cause mortalities. And we, we think about a wind turbine, we're well aware of bats and birds of prey like golden eagles that collide with those turbines. That's a direct impact. Another form of direct impact is just direct habitat loss, where the habitat is converted from wildlife habitat into something else, or, or habitat for even a different species. But there's species like pronghorn, and is, you know, does wind energy affect pronghorn? That's a really good question. And probably what we do know is that there's a larger set of impacts called indirect impacts, and those are more related. We see that um, in these animals as they avoid areas that they're not willing to use because they've changed. They may be noisier, they may be uh, more, more of the areas converted into something else, and so that's the potential. So I'm mostly going to be talking about those indirect impacts, which can cascade in then to changes in vital rates for wildlife populations, and they can, they can change the size of a population eventually. So, so how does this work? And I just have kind of a simple depiction here of a, of a really wonderful landscape. This is the Atlantic Rim, where we've been conducting sage grouse and now pronghorn research in southern Carbon County. This is a really great place for sage grouse. I'm just going to tell you that. And they, they occur here in high numbers and all life stages from breeding habitat all the way to the winter, wintering habitat is provided here. The historical disturbance that were the change maybe in this landscape would have been fencing provided for livestock production. And sure there's some fence collisions and things like that, but still the landscape for most of wildlife uh, remains relatively undisturbed. But then uh, some things can start changing, like addition of a gas field. And then the infrastructure maybe associated with that gas field can even change a predator community, like for ravens. And uh, ravens then can move into these areas and begin to depredate on sage grouse nests. And we're, this area was uh, coal bed methane development. And there's quite a bit of produced water that's there. And, and everyone here, I think, is familiar with West Nile virus. And it can be spread from these areas. And, and sage grouse are very vulnerable to that. And then finally, this really exaggerated depiction here of <laughs> millions of wind turbines. What does that do to this habitat? Well, it's just dramatically changed it, right? It's kind of industrialized the landscape. And that's not how it all is, right? I'm just showing this up here just as like this could happen, I guess. But this is what can, can change the landscape and, and then animals have to respond to that. And that's what our research we've been doing in our lab is trying to understand these kinds of responses. So we see impacts in the sagebrush steppe with a variety of animals. In, in western Wyoming, Hall Sawyer's work with mule deer showed 
avoidance of the infrastructure in the Pine Atlantic line. There's been work down with songbirds, um, West Nile virus, weeds like cheatgrass that establishes in disturbed areas, and even uh, further north in the boreal forest in Canada, um, impacts on, on boreal caribou, the woodland caribou, uh, that have been documented with kind of more human disturbed landscape and even more wildfire as well in this paper, a real strong correlation with change in population. So kind of the mechanisms behind this, you see, do you see the sage grouse, female sage grouse, she's on her nest. And this is, uh, you know, oftentimes in the spring when they nest, we'll still have spring snowstorms. You can see that female right there, her eye is right there. And she's waiting out until everything melts and she can hopefully hatch her eggs and make her way with her brood. But kind of what happens, this diagram right here just kind of talks about and shows the process, more disturbance, um, more energy that is more energy out that, that is uh, used for other things to to be aware of what's around their surroundings, maybe to move, poor con body condition, um, reproductive sex declines, and even in some cases predation rates increase, and then we have a you know change in the population size, and we saw that we've seen that a couple places in the state with our research. One place we saw that was in a wind farm by Hannah, Wyoming. So Chad LeBeau, who is one of my master's students, we published this paper in the Journal of Wildlife Management last year. And what you see here is a hazard risk chart. So um, what, we, what we've done is we've just looked at the response and distance to the nearest wind turbine. And the hazard rate goes from zero to one. And you can kind of see the closer you are to wind turbines, there's a real dramatic effect on brood survival that finally levels off at about 10 kilometers away and then disappears from the nearest wind turbine. The effect on nest success, not as dramatic, but there's quite an effect for quite a ways out as well. And when we looked a little deeper, kind of drilled down into this a little bit deeper, uh, these are some numbers, kind of effect sizes. Um, for every one kilometer in distance from a wind turbine, nest failure decreases by 7.1% and brood failure by 38.1%. So we, sometimes we see that. We measure those things and we know that. There wasn't any, any information out there before this study on how wind turbines might affect greater sage grouse. So we have now a, an, an effect size, a distance where future wind turbine placements can be put in places away from sage grouse leks and to reduce this kind of disturbance effect. So that's, that's kind of the goal of the research we have. It's applied, it's trying to answer these questions and provide information that people in the future can use to benefit wildlife. So I'm going to switch and talk about pronghorn, also with wind energy development. These are highly intelligent animals that are really evolved to live in the sagebrush steppe. Very interesting species and they're from North America, I mean, just like sage grouse. So the question is, pronghorn, when they go to places, especially in the southern part of the state where snow is a real issue, um, is there, do we see greater movement? If we have, if these animals have to move more, then we know they're going to expend more energy and that may impact their survival rates. So we study these, actually I was talking to a couple, a couple when I was having dinner and about the Dunlap Ranch. This is at the Dunlap Ranch, one energy facility, just about 10 miles north of Medicine Bow. And it's in that area with that blue color where wind speeds are really high and so wind development is a great place to, to put that in, in those areas. So we worked here for three winters and kind of our question is if, if there's an issue, um, we can measure the daily net displacement of these animals. How far do they move basically in a day in relationship also to the distance from a wind turbine. There may be a place where this effect um, finally dissipates here in this case at about five kilometers and that's kind of what we wanted to look at and that would be our impact threshold. Anything from five kilometers closer is where an these animals are moving more. Anything past that they really don't and so we, so we did that. So my student Katie Taylor, she put together these box plots and they're just a summary of all the locations and I had to have to tell you there were um, about 50 female pronghorn that collected several locations a day. In total, I can't remember, there's tens of thousands of locations 
each winter plotted in all those points. There's a lot of data in there. And she put these box plots together, and they're plotted by in two kilometer increments away from the nearest wind turbine, and then and the y axis here, how, how far these animals are moving, what's the daily net displacement. As you can see, it's very flat. There really was very little change at all. And when we conducted a linear regression, it was flat. It's almost zero. In other words, there's really no effect. These animals occurred by the wind turbines, but they didn't really respond to them. They didn't move any more than they would have if they were far, far away from the wind turbines. So, kind of two different dramatic, I sort of the sage grouse are really dramatically affected in nesting and brood survival. And then these pronghorn and their movements were not. We also modeled pronghorn survival, and we didn't find any effect of wind turbines on their survival. We found other effects related to snow depth and how far they were from roads and, other th and sagebrush availability and things like that. So I'm really open to the fact that not all energy development research shows negative effect. This one certainly did not. So now I'm going to talk about something closer to home. This is uh, in our fortification creek between Buffalo and Gillette. Um, there's a, 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 an elk population that was reintroduced there in the 1950s. It's of great interest because there's really large bulls for hunters to pursue. And this is kind of what, that's what it looks like. It's kind of a broken country with lots of Rocky Mountain juniper on the breaks. And then you have mixed grass prairie um, on the uplands. And this, it, this population was studied, in fact, by Laurel Vicklin's husband, who worked for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department back in the 1990s. And we're really grateful for that work because we had data to compare what changed when we came in in 2008. So a large, a large area, um, about 500 square kilometers, but then we found the elk were using about three times that area, almost 1,500 square kilometers. And I want to show you what happened there. So we have this pre-development data that uh, Olin collected, and we were able to create a resource selection function model. And that's what I have right here. This is summer, and this is winter. Those dark areas on that map are the most preferred, highest probability habitat use. Um, we also remodeled when we had data from 2008, 10, and 11 below during development when about 700, there was about 700 well pads by the time our study was, our study ended. And you can see a change here, right? Before the elk were quite distributed in both seasons and then finally after, during development they were mostly kind of in this north to northwestern area where there was a wilderness study area kind of right in the middle of that that the elk used a lot and the area around there that wasn't as disturbed. And if you, you even can see back there, this is one reason I wanted the lights off, is there's a road network in here with well pads. You can kind of see here there's really none of that in there. The elk kind of shifted their habitat use to avoid that. And when we looked a little deeper just at the change, that's, that's what this is a depiction of change in summer and winter. There was a 43% change in the highest probability of use habitat in the summer and a 50% change in the winter. The black areas on both those maps are areas that did not change. The gray areas are areas where they increased use during development. And then um, the, reason that the, develop, the reason that the change mostly in this table shows this is actually a change in use of roads where during development elk spent a lot more time away from roads. And I've got a really neat slide that kind of shows that a little better in a second. So I had my student Clay Buchanan uh, do quite a few things out there. He measured vehicle traffic and you can kind of see the different BLM roads, uh, well roads, access roads, and main roads, just differences in activity there. But I also encouraged him to look at sound. So he put out some devices that actually uh, record noise and then he was able to create a model that created a map and 85% of all the elk locations, all these black dots on here, occurred in the blue area which is area with ambient noise which is about 30 to 35 decibels. The red areas on there are about twice ambient noise where it was really noisy by compressor stations and other things that were quite noisy. So you can kind of see those elk maybe responded to sound. That may be one of the, one of the mechanisms of their habitat selection choices. And then Clay further looked at where these animals went um, during the day and versus during the night. It was really interesting and because they stayed there. They could have immigrated. We had, I think, three elk that left from the 58 that we captured, but almost all of them chose to stay in the Fortification Creek area. 
And these maps are really interesting because the blue areas are areas they went to at night. They weren't there in the day, but they went there at night. And you really see a dramatic change, especially in the winter. That's, the, that's, uh, that's this map right here. What were they doing? What changed? Um, what we found out is that they actually left the cover of, of juniper in those kind of rugged areas, came up where the well pads were, and went closer to roads. And then the, we also measured um, nutritional content of, gra of grasses and forbs and found a, a response in the winter to areas with greater grass digestible energy were being selected for in the winter. That was an important predictor in elk habitat selection. So it, I'll show you what that uh, looks like in a minute, kind of a little schematic. What's driving all this was the distance to roads. So during development on this landscape, if you just, what Clay did is he just looked across the entire landscape and all the pixels on his map, on the average, almost everywhere in that landscape was within 300 meters of a road. But if you looked at where the elk went in the gray bars, you can see that they chose to go to places on average much further away from roads. So they went to those places that were far away from roads. And during the day in the summer, it was about, almost all of these were close to 600 meters or about twice the distance as they were uh, just, on, just, on, just randomly across that area. But there was a difference even at night where they went closer. That's why these bars are slightly lower. And he, he conducted a t-test and found a difference as well. So this is kind of the, almost the take-home message here. He, he, that road counter data he had, he's plotted that in this histogram um, throughout the day, 7 in the morning all the way to 6 in the morning. You can kind of see the, you know, the, light, the, the day side and the night side. Elk were spending during the day areas with less forage, closer to trees. Rocky Mountain Juniper was 11% of the cover in the study area, so they spent a lot of time there. At night, they would come out away from those trees, closer to the roads where there was more forage, especially in the winter when they needed that digestible energy. And so we wanted to look a little closer too, just to see is there a, is there a population effect. We couldn't model survival here, so what we, what we chose to do is look at body condition scores from hunter harvested hearts and, and kidneys. And we compared the, the greater Fort, Fortification Creek area here and the, the black dots with um, samples that were collected in the Rochelle Hills about 60 miles south. And we did find a significant effect for heart fat content. And this is, the hearts are, are basically scored against a, 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 a pictorial, right? So the highest fat content like this heart has a higher score than the, the lower one. And that's what you see plotted here on the y-axis. But we didn't find any difference with kidneys, with kidney fat, but we did with heart fat. So it's kind of a slight indication that maybe these animals are kind of experiencing more stress and you know, expending more calories and just didn't, weren't able to store as much fat. That's quite possible. So that's, that was kind of our conclusion from that. And that paper's in review right now in the journal. So I'm gonna um, now go to a, almost a different idea what I've talked about, I've, I've, I've uh, presented information on effects where there were impacts and not impacts, and also maybe how, like these elk in this one example, um, how they dealt with the impact by going to areas that weren't as disturbed. Okay, that's a possible as a possible mitigation um, form of mitigation that animals can use. But what I want to talk about now is what about places where we have an energy development. And we want to identify the very best habitat where we're very confident that these animals can have habitat in the long run. So maybe future development can kind of avoid them. And so our work really focused on identifying source and sink habitats. The source habitat would be areas where excess animals are produced, where they have a real high survival rate. And sink habitat would be areas animals go to, they're not going to have the benefits they do in source habitats and survival is much lower. So we worked in the Atlantic Rim. You can see the map here. It has a real high sagebrush cover. When we were doing our work, there were about 90 leks. There are 89 leks. They're real, you know, real high abundance of leks. There, there was a coal bed methane development here, and this is the infrastructure, kind of these black areas here where the coal bed methane occurred within our study area. And so what, what Chris did, this is Chris Carroll's work, and Chris 
is a biologist that works in Sheridan, so he's he's up very close to, to Gillette here, where, where he lives and works. And what he did is he put together a uh, a series of probability of occurrence maps with resource selection functions. So he put them for for sage grouse, female sage grouse that um, nested um, also during their early brood rearing period. And he also looked at females that were unsuccessful in nesting during the early and rate, late brood rearing period as well. So um, he was able to look at all these different life stages. And then he, and what I forgot to say is what is the resource selection function? If I was a good professor, I'd explain that to you. That is a, a model that is able to um, create a probability of use of a, in this case, of a map pixel. How do we do that? Well, we collect data from uh, environmental and anthropogenic variables. We do a bunch of variable screening to see which ones are informative. And then we uh, put that in a statistical model. And we're able to come up with the set of variables and their actual effects. So when we look at the landscape at different scales, we, we know where the very best habitat is. And the map that so he shows here, that very best habitat is actually the green areas. So it's a scale from zero to one of probability, right? So the highest probability is in green, the lowest probability is in red, and you can kind of see those shifting in this landscape during these different life stages of these sage grouse. In most cases, the areas that are developed for gas um, were, were avoided, but not in all. Um, sage grouse really actually were willing to nest in or around the gas field, but they may not have done as well, or maybe they did, just depended on the bird. So you see, kind of see how that works. And what Chris did is then he actually put all those um, probability of occurrence maps into this one large uh, summer probability of occurrence model for female sage grouse. So that's in this map right here, the very best habitat, the highest probability of use is in green, and the lowest is in purple. And you can kind of see, especially in the north end of a study area, uh, there was more use, more, more higher probability of occurrence habitat. So he's got this one side of the equation, which is these are the areas where these birds are going to go, where they prefer to select, because environmental and anthropogenic factors elicit their response to, to be in those areas. And the green areas suggest that combination of sagebrush cover, distance to road, topography, all these measurements is ideal for sage grouse. That's where they want to be. The purple areas are the areas they tend to avoid. So, so what Chris did after that is he put together a survival probability and he's got one for, um, for nests. He has one for brood rearing after the, the nests have hatched. And finally, for, for females all throughout the summer, where's the best habitat for them? And he created that, and you can see here the blue areas are the highest probability. And a lot of the gas field, so that's the point I should have made, is a lot of the gas field actually would have been high survival because they weren't being impacted by the gas. They were, they were actually more choosing to avoid it because of the noise and that kind of thing. So the habitat there, they just didn't use it. If they would have used it, they probably wouldn't have incurred uh, you know, a, a survival issue, except there was, I know, an effect a little bit for broods, and I'll show you that here in a minute. So then what Chris did is he actually took uh, survival rates that we estimated with a, a model called the Kaplan-Meier Survival Estimator, and we um, fused that together with these maps right here to create this habitat productivity layer. The habitat productivity layer is, is interesting because it approximates this, um, sorry, this symbol, this Greek symbol, which is lambda. Lambda is a finite rate of increase. Anytime lambda is over one, that suggests an area where maybe a source habitat is. That's where conditions are ideal for survival for nest broods, uh, adult females. So you see this productivity layer right here. Uh, the areas in blue are the very highest ones. The kind of areas in green are kind of right in the middle, about one. And then when you get to the warmer colors, the yellows and reds and oranges, that's where they have low, low, low productivity based on the conditions there. So what we did is we then, um, and this table right here kind of explains it all, um, he broke the, the probability of summer habitat selection into three quantiles. 
and anything that's greater than um, 66 percent would be really the high primary habitat, the habitat that they select the very highest. Um, we have this fitness metric from that, from that map I showed you. Um, anything that's uh, above one indicates source habitat. So we've broken this down kind of into this, these four categories. We have primary source, secondary source, primary sink, secondary sink, and finally, if we have this, this bottom quantile, anything less than 33 percent for summer habitat selection is considered a low occurrence habitat for where these, where these birds do not select habitat. And this is the map that he put together with all that information overlaying the resource selection model map with the survival probability function. And you can see um, the very best habitat is primary source. That's the highest quantile selection, anything 66 percent and above with, with uh, lambda being over one. And that's about a third of a study area, 30 percent of a study area. Um, secondary source habitat, they would select it a little lower between 33 and 66 percent of the time, 29 percent. And the sink habitats are ones where um, there's an issue, especially the secondary sink. Secondary sink is kind of the, there's a few places on here you'll see this orange color. Birds that would select those areas may be an ecological trap. They maybe are willing to go there, but if they go there, they'll probably incur really low survival based on the conditions in that area. And just to verify and validate how good the map was, Chris actually looked at the locations of all the, the males counted in 2009. There were 678 on 25 leks, and 92 percent of those males were within or immediately adjacent to the predicted source habitat. So it just suggests how good that habitat was. They were willing to use those areas, and it suggests that that's a, a really good way to kind of break this data up. So the final uh, thing I have to show you, which is a great interest to the, to the state of Wyoming, is the, the governor, Wyoming governor's sage-grass executive order is based on, it's a, it's a science-based um, policy which has a few um, science, um, I guess I would call them metrics that, are, that, are, that drive the, the sage-grass executive order. One of those is, and the main one actually is, is a 5% disturbance cap. So within the core areas of the state, there's 31 of these core areas, and they're 24% of the land area of the state. The goal is for no more than 5% surface disturbance. And what Chris found for brood survival was a, a real strong relationship to that cap, and it was quite interesting that we found that. So the effect he found for brood survival was within one, was within a uh, one square kilometer area. And this map right here shows what that really looks like. This red point is a brood location. And then he's got, uh, you know, 0.564 uh, kilometer radii, which if you do the uh, pi r squared will be one square kilometer. And the, the uh, disturbance here, which happens to be one, two, and almost part of a third well pad, and then the roads associated with that, that's 5% disturbance. That's what it looks like on the landscape. And if you, if you look at this um, depiction right here, once you get to about five and it's starting to be six percent surface disturbance, the risk of nest or brood failure, of a brood dying, starts to go way up. And you get to about six and a half or seven percent virtually uh, of, of surface disturbance in one square kilometer area, virtually every brood would not survive. And that's what, that, that's what this, uh, this figure shows. Um, and I just kind of want to bring that up because it's like we do have a policy in place. We have some information that even supports the policy further. And Chris is now looking across the state at several study areas with, with uh, lots of data, a lot more than we had here to better understand these thresholds of disturbance. So my conclusions are, are four. And I thought about these. You know, what, what could I tell everyone here? And it's interesting. It's not all that straightforward. Um, Energy development can impact resource selection and fitness, but it differs across species and forms of development. I've talked about wind energy, where we did have an effect on sage grouse, but we did not with pronghorn. Um, I've talked about oil and gas development, where um, we had an effect on sage grouse for sure, but um, elk seem to be able to mitigate that at some level, at least in the development we looked at. Um, 
in some cases, this risk of disturbance can elicit a population level effect. Earlier on, I showed you a slide that, that showed a 3.6 fold increase in well pads in 20 years from 1991 to 2011 and in, across the state of Wyoming. That was associated with a 24 percent decline. Our model showed us that in male sage grouse select attendance. We, we know that can happen. But some species like the elk I showed you in Fortification Creek may be able to self-mitigate their risk through just changing their behavior so they reduce the fitness consequences by changing their behavior. Some species like sage grouse may not have that ability to do that, but some animals like elk, maybe they do, and pronghorn probably as well. So how can we get a better idea of all these, of all these uh, interactions? I think we have to kind of link, like Chris Carroll did in the Atlantic Rim, link occurrence and fitness together so we, we can see where animals go and what the outcome is of that to better inform habitat and species conservation uh, in areas where animals are faced with energy development. I'll stop right there. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sir, you were talking about the studies that you did up in the fortification area, and you stop in about 2013 or 2012, somewhere in that area. Are you still studying up there? Because if you if you go across northern Campbell County right now, you, I mean, you're going to find elk all the way across the whole sure. north, just about. Yeah, we're not still studying elk up there. Um, our work ended in 2011. There's uh, um, the BLM though. Um, has done three captures. So right now I'm trying to think probably about seven years into this now. So there's a consulting firm, West Incorporated, that actually is, is providing the information to the BLM about how elk are responding to the energy development in that area. So we're not doing it anymore as a research study, but the consulting firm is doing it kind of maybe more in environmental compliance monitoring. In the, in the back? In the Sage Grouse Core Area, do you think that the governor's plan has identified all the core areas, or are there still some out there that are not identified yet? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, so, the, so you have to think a little bit about how those are set up. Um, they protect 82% of the breeding population of, of male sage grouse in the spring. And like I said earlier, there's 31 of them, 24% of the area of the state. So your question is, did they find them all? The identification of those is, was largely you know, collaboration with the state and other partners, and it wasn't necessarily all biological. They had to, they took places out that were already permitted for energy development, and so the policy of the core area to like limit surface disturbance to five percent in some places wouldn't have worked, so they were excluded. The biggest question right now is winter concentration areas. Where where did some populations go in the winter to spend their winter, and we've been working on that in my lab and it's been interesting to kind of see some the larger core areas tend to capture the year-round uh, populations like uh, you know that you know the uh, Sweetwater Valley Fremont County Natrona County most of those birds have habitat year-round in core area but you go to say the Bighorn Basin and uh, we have a paper in review right now you know it was about 50 or 60 percent of the winter locations were outside the core area it's just just the way they were set up they didn't it was based on breeding habitat, not on other life stages like winter habitat. So that's probably the state I think right now is struggling with that the most. But there are some uh, restrictions, stipulations within the winter, even in non-core areas, uh, to, re to uh, reduce development during the winter when birds are more vulnerable. So that's kind of what the protection is, you know, the non-core areas during the winter. So that probably wasn't an answer you were waiting for, but I. I just had to say it, <laughs> so because I, I could, because I knew what I knew something about it. Any other questions? Right here. Yeah. Your graduates uh, did experiments on elk hearts, and are you allowed to do that with the sage grouse to see what kind of uh, impact, physical impact there is? That's a good question. Yeah. So could we, could we take uh, hearts from sage grouse and look at their fat content? You know, um, so so cervids, elk, deer, prong not pronghorn, elk, deer, moose, caribou, they, they store a lot of fat. It's really important for their winter survival. Sage grouse gain weight during the winter. They're not as heavy at the start of winter. But what we do instead of looking at organs for sage grouse, we actually weigh them and we capture them. And another metric we have is the wing cord length. It's the uh, measurement from the tip of their wing to their axis, where their wing touches their chest. 
that's another kind of measurement of body condition. So the, the mass and then the swing cord length, we, we use that to actually kind of evaluate, you know, it's, it's a potential predictor of survival, really. The bigger birds might do that. And our work around Jeffrey City, we're capturing chicks. And that's, that's our, one of our responses that we have with those chicks. If they're larger, we're, we're comparing that to their diets because our assumption is if they're eating a really high quality diet, they should be bigger and that might help them to survive longer in the future. So I've never seen anyone that actually collected sage grouse hearts. What I have seen in a winter study in Colorado where they had entire carcasses and ground them up and then looked at the fat content in the carcass, carcass composition. But I, I've never used sage grouse hearts, but it's, it's, a good, it's a good thought. It really is. Yep. Yeah. How many years can the sage grouse live? That's a great question. So the same area in Colorado, northern Colorado, they had a banding study going on for a long time and some of the oldest birds were females. They lived longer than males, about eight years. A male might be six years. Yeah, they're, they're really different. They live a lot longer than other game birds like pheasants or quail. They have a lower reproductive rate. Kind of what we see is a good year, like the last couple of years, there's a pulse in productivity and that's what keeps the sage grouse populations from declining too much. They, get, they have a little upswing with better conditions. So long -lived, really a long-lived game bird for sure. Yeah, right here. So you, you had the energy impact, the energy development impact. What about the impact in correlation with predators of sage grouse? Sure. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. It gets brought up a lot. Um, we do have, in, in conjunction with changing landscapes, we also have changing predator communities, right? So some really good work done in, in this part of the state um, evaluated that in, in one sense, which was they looked at areas that had more water. And water is associated with skunks and, and raccoons and even red foxes. And so predation around those areas with more water was probably higher and they had a lower nest survival than areas with less water. So, you know, there's landscape changes that do create a situation where predator communities increase. And ravens is probably the best known example of that, um, where we have more, you know, we've worked with ravens, and especially in the southwest and in southern Wyoming with Utah State University and my postdoc, John Dinkins. And kind of what they, what he found was, you know, areas that have more disturbance have more ravens and there's more impact on sage grouse that way too. So there's a lot of discussion about that, you know, as a potential mitigation to control ravens. And, and he looked at that too. We're about ready to send a paper in review for that where wildlife services controlled ravens. And then John evaluated raven abundance and nest survival and in areas where they controlled ravens, the density did decline and then the nest success did go up a little bit. The question is in a situation like that, you know, is, is it, it's not a long-term solution. You know, our, our biggest problem is the habitat is amenable to increase in these predators because they have, you know, roadkill and garbage and there's things you can do like, you know, uh, cover garbage uh, landfills, for instance, or, you know, an area where maybe there's more, um, you know, livestock, like uh, sheep uh, do get depredated by, by uh, and dead sheep, of course, too, are a good food source for scavengers like ravens. So there's, there's those issues, too. So, yeah, it's, it's complicated. I, you know, predators certainly have an impact on, on sage-grouse populations, and a lot of it's just due to our kind of changing conditions for them, so they increase a little bit.